All right, welcome everyone to the virtual college exploration program in partnership with colleges that change lives. This is the University of Puget Sound information session. Before I pass it over to the team, I'll kick us off with some housekeeping items in case you haven't heard these yet. We do have more sessions with Colleges That Change Lives through Tuesday evening. So feel free to check out the schedule if you're interested in learning more about other universities and colleges across the nation. When you do register for these sessions, you do get a barcode in that confirmation email, but know that that barcode is not necessary for any of the virtual events that you participate in. And we are recording all of these sessions and posting them to our website shortly after the session concludes. So whether you wanna rewatch a session you participated live in or watch one you may have missed, um, just check back on our website for those recordings. And then you'll notice that you will be able to see and hear the presenters. They can't see or hear you all. This is webinar style format. So any questions you have throughout the presentation, feel free to use that Q&A box to type those questions in and the presenters will do their best to address those throughout the session. So I will pass it over to Mike to get us started. Thanks so much. Hi everyone and thank you, Jen. Thanks for getting us kicked off with us housekeeping notes. Uh, thank you all for tuning in. My name is Mike Rottersman. I'm an Associate Director of Admission here at University of Puget Sound. I've been on staff for 14 years. Prior to that, I was a student at Puget Sound. I majored in politics and government, minored in environmental policy, and also played on the soccer team when I was there. Uh, as Jen already told you, we have 45 minutes. It is going to be a hard stop. Uh, we're going to talk for maybe 30 minutes and then answer your questions for the final 15. If you'd like to interact with us via that Q&A, we're gonna do our best to keep up with your questions as we go. If for some reason we miss them, uh, please ask them again when we get to the Q&A. And if for some reason we don't answer your question tonight, please connect with us. We're easy to find admission at pugetsound.edu and we'd love to hear from you. Uh, one of the silver linings in all of this madness that is COVID-19 is that you're not talking to just me at a college fair somewhere in the world for CTCL. Um, you have the opportunity to you know, have some different experiences like having three of us during this session. I'm joined by two of our fabulous Puget Sound loggers and I'm gonna let each of them introduce themselves and then we will jump into the presentation. So Romy, why don't you take it away? All right, thank you. Hi everyone, my name is Romy. I use she, her pronouns, and I'm originally from the Bay Area of California. Um, I am going to be a rising junior this year, um, and I'm majoring in exercise science and minoring in Spanish. Um, and a few fun activities I'm involved in on campus. I am obviously a admissions tour guide. I am also a peer ally, which is a student-led group on campus that supports survivors of sexual assault. I'm also a former student athlete and also a member of our Greek life system here on campus. And I'm gonna hand it over to Tanvi and let her introduce herself. Thanks, Remy. Hi, everyone. My name is Tanvi. I'm a rising senior here at Puget Sound. I am in the business leadership program with a double major in international political economy and a minor in Asian studies. And around campus, I'm also a part of the admissions team. I am a tour guide and engagement coordinator. I also am involved in Greek life and am a, a member of the experiential learning team, which you'll hear more about. Great. Thank you, Tanvi. Thank you, Romy. Before we dive into the presentation, I just want to recognize that you know, the world that we live in today is obviously really different than we expected. Um, it's been a crazy year. Uh, you know, I expected that we'd be welcoming students to our campus this month. Uh, and turns out we're not. We're going to be virtual. We're going to be online this semester. Your college search is really different than you expected your college search to be. And I guess this is my public service announcement. Um, you know, look at, look for the silver linings, give yourself some grace. You can still have fun with this experience. I think that the college search and one of the reasons I've been doing this for 15 years is that this is such an exciting time in your lives. And I'm just privileged to be a part of it in my role in the admission office. Um, so, you know, take deep breaths, uh, connect with us virtually, take advantage of some of the things that we didn't offer and other colleges aren't or didn't offer in the past that you now have the opportunity to do uh, and celebrate those things. You know, I've talked to so many families recently and so many students 
that are really upset that they don't get to take the SAT or the ACT. And I'm just like, come on, celebrate that. Um, you know, I get it. Maybe you're a really strong test taker and you really want that test score to look solid on your application, but there are things that are out of your control this year. Um, that SAT or that ACT is out of your control. It's out of your hands. So don't let those things that you can't control chew you up. Take advantage of the things that you can control. Um, most college campuses aren't welcoming guests for traditional visits right now. I'm sure some are, but at the University of Puget Sound, we're not. If you're in driving distance from Puget Sound, our campus is still open to the public. You're not gonna get into any buildings, you know, but you're welcome to pack a picnic. If you live in Portland and you wanna make that two hour drive, throw a, a blanket down on the lawn, bring your dog, um, sit out on our beautiful campus, imagine what it's like to be a college student, and then come visit us and do a tour with either Romy or Tanvi in the coming months where fingers crossed we're able to offer you those more traditional experiences. Um, so enough about that. I just wanted to um, mention that before we move on. Now, if you give me just a second, I'm going to um, share my screen. Um, can you guys see that? Is that working? Great. Yeah, it works. Thank you. Wonderful. Uh, so let's just dive right in and talk a little bit about University of Puget Sound. I think the best place to start is location. Uh, for those of you traveling from any distance, you're most likely to fly into SeaTac, Seattle Tacoma International Airport. SeaTac is located just about 30 minutes north of Tacoma, about 15 minutes south of Seattle. So if you're doing the math, Seattle's about a 45 minute drive from Tacoma. Vancouver, BC is anywhere from three to four hours, depending on that border crossing. Portland to the south is about a two to two and a half hour drive. Um, on that east-west axis, to the west, you have the Olympic National Park, which I'm going there tomorrow uh, to do some hiking. Um, one of the most amazing places to hike and explore the outdoors in the Olympic Mountains. To the east, you have Mount Rainier and the Cascade Mountain Range. And so you're in this really unique setting where you have to the north and south, this urban corridor, and to the east and west, these amazing mountain ranges. Um, each of those mountain ranges are about a 90 minute drive from Tacoma. And of course, as you might imagine, based on the name of our university, we are on the Puget Sound. Um, so we are about a mile from saltwater, right on that beautiful, glorious Pacific Northwest Sound. The city of Tacoma for me is like the ideal city. About 230,000 people. It's not a mega city, it's not hyper urban. It's urban just enough in my opinion. And what I mean by that, is you have this urban landscape where you have nightlife, restaurants, four major museums, three professional sports teams, things to do, those things that you would want in city life, but it's easy to navigate, it's easy to get around. When you're on our campus and you're in our neighborhood, you don't feel like you're in this downtown, metallic, concrete, urban type of place. Um, it actually feels a lot more residential and suburban on our campus. And I love that because you get to choose when you want to engage in that urban experience. It's not 24-7. Um, speaking of our neighborhood, which Tacoma, by the way, is definitely a city that's built in neighborhoods. Uh, we're in the North End neighborhood. And I'm going to turn it over to Romy and let Romy talk a little bit about the neighborhood around campus, what she loves to do in Tacoma, and what she loves to do in the Pacific Northwest. Thank you. Yeah, so I'd love to talk about just what we can do and like activities that students um, like to do on the weekends, especially um, and anytime really we're not in the classroom. Uh, so in North Tacoma, we have a few really popular spots that students like to visit. Um, this picture here actually is a Tacoma Proctor's Farmer's Market. And this farmer's market is actually super cool. It um, happens every Saturday and it actually lasts through the summer all the way until December, which is really cool and unique. Um, and I know I like to go on the weekends and walk over from campus. It's about a 10 minute walk and go with friends and then just walk and see like what different places are offering um, and also to, dry, to just to try some really good food. Um, so that's on Proctor. We also have Sixth Avenue. Sixth Avenue is very similar to Proctor. Um, they have a lot of restaurants, um, bars for our older students, um, as well as a really good ice cream shop. 
and it's kind of like a mini city kind of feel as well as we also have the waterfront which is my favorite place to go um so we have point reston and point defiance and that's all on the waterfront it's about a 10 minute drive from campus um and i really really like to go there because it has one of the best views of mount rainier which we can see on campus but it's even beautiful uh looking at it over the water and Point Defiance actually has like a zoo, an aquarium, a five mile drive, a bunch of different little hikes and trails, uh, a beach that you can go put your feet in the water, as well as um, Point Reston is also a little bit more of a modern um, kind of vibe. They have a lot of restaurants and movie theater, um, more ice cream shops, as well as I believe they're actually building um, a public market there as well. So those are a little um, fun places that we have located close to Tacoma. I actually went to Mount Rainier National Park the other day uh, for the second time this summer. And so I'm very passionate about going outside and exploring what the entire Pacific Northwest has. Um, we're located in between the Olympics and the Cascades. We're an hour and a half from Mount Rainier, 45 minutes from Seattle, depending on traffic. And so we're just physically located in one of the most beautiful spots in the nation, in my opinion. And so that's a couple of fun things I like to do, but I'm gonna give it back to Mike so he can kind of keep talking about Tacoma. Yeah, as I mentioned earlier, um, four major museums, you get a little bit of a view of downtown Tacoma here with the sound in the background. Um, some of the museums are highlighted. You see the Museum of Glass is that metallic cylinder cone that's sticking out right in the middle of the photo. You see the Port of Tacoma there as well, one of the busiest ports in the United States actually. Our campus itself, if you use your imagination and you head out along that waterfront and kind of take a left around that corner, we're located up the hill and about three miles from downtown in a quiet residential part of the city. One of the things that I think makes Puget Sound really stand out amongst all the colleges that you might be looking at is that we are a national and residential school. And what that basically means is most of our students come from far away. Over 80% of our students are not from our home state of Washington. Close to 70% of our students live on campus. And so I guess kind of a blessing and a curse in the sense that one of the main reasons we aren't able to host in-person classes this fall is that we are such a residential place and our students come from all over the country and from all over the world. When we are back on campus, it truly is a blessing. Um, it's what I describe as a living and learning community. It's that concept that what you do outside of the classroom is not separate from your education. You don't leave class or leave the library and then the learning just stops. How you engage in clubs, organizations, activities, whether it's varsity sports, intramural sports, club sports, theater, music, student government, Greek life, fraternities, sororities, all of that is a part of your education. It's why we have a two-year live-on requirement. So all of our first year and second year students are required to live on campus. Um, and it's also why we see a significant number of our juniors and seniors stay on campus by choice because they are really plugged in. We like to say a Puget Sound education is something you do. It's not something you get. Um, it is really an active uh, education and an active student body. Um, to talk a little bit more specifically, and yes, I'll back up, that is a residence hall there. They are stunning. We are so lucky. I think our students are so spoiled to have the kinds of places that they live on campus. Um, to talk to you a little bit about what that first year living experience might be like, I'm gonna turn it over to Tanvi. All right, so welcome to um, Broom. Um, this is the image that you see is a typical first year residence hall and first year residence room. This room specifically is in the building that I lived in my first year, Todd Fibbs. And that is probably the biggest residence hall in terms of students that it has. So typically there would be about 50 students on each floor of this four floor residence hall. Um, we have about six residence halls total for first years and they are only for first years kind of to get that bonding experience that Mike was talking about. They definitely stay true to the residential experience in terms of how you're learning and growing as a first year. 
One thing I love to highlight is the resident assistant and re resident life program. So we have um, a bunch of students that are upperclassmen that are able to kind of serve as mentors and resident assistants or RAs to our first year and continuing students. So they're located in pretty much any residence hall or on campus housing that you will have on campus. I mentioned that this is a typical first year bedroom. All the tan furniture you see automatically comes with the room. So per student, there is a desk, a bed, a wardrobe, and a chair, and one bookshelf, which is almost always used as a snack cabinet, as I see it is here in this photo, um, that students can share. Typically, you will be living with one other person. Most of our rooms are doubles, but we do have triples and quads in our North Quad residence halls. Obviously, those rooms are bigger to accommodate um, those spaces and those students. Um, and I also want to mention that you are able to rent a refrigerator and or microwave through the university. It is first come first serve, but it's great for out of state students like me that won't have access to take those things back. And a great thing about that two year on campus living requirement is that students are allowed to store their items on campus between years that they're living. So you're, up, you're able to store in the basement of the next residence hall you will be living in. We also have so many options for on-campus living for students and that's why I think that students choose to remain on campus for their junior and senior years. So you can be in a residence hall as you continue as a sophomore or you can live in um, a suite style building like the image that was shown previously. So that would be each student getting a single and you have about five or six students that share a bathroom, a living space and a kitchen area. All of our Greek houses are also owned by the university. So living in a fraternity or sorority will fulfill your on-campus living requirement. And as Mike mentioned before, we're kind of smack dab in the middle of the neighborhood. So the university owns a lot of the houses around the campus, um, usually not more than a block or two away. And if you rent those houses from the university, it also counts as on campus. Um, residential programs include things like the business leadership program, which I mentioned I'm part of, and our honors program, which are cohort based. So you're living with the students in your cohort your first year, and it's really helpful to kind of have that bonding experience, whether you want to go down to a seminar together, you want to do homework together, anything like that. We also have what we call green living, which is for students that are incredibly interested in the outdoors. So you always have like a hiking buddy or a kayaking buddy, and we have a healthy living option which is for students that are extremely committed to staying absent from drugs and alcohol. And I will pass it back on to Mike. Thanks, Tanvi. So obviously location, uh, the Northwest, Tacoma, you know, clubs, organizations, res life is a huge part of your college experience. Um, but there's also a thing called academics we wanna talk about. And so uh, I'm gonna dive in a little bit to just what the academic life is like at Puget Sound. Um, I describe Puget Sound as the big end of small. And don't let me confuse you, we are not a big university by any stretch of the imagination. But I think that especially rings true to students who are looking at these CTCL type colleges, these national liberal arts colleges, some of them are really, really small. Um, I'm not saying that we're the biggest of the group, but as you look at the range of sizes of undergraduate students amongst those kinds of colleges nationally, we tend to be on the bigger end of that scale. Our average class size is still just 17. Our student to faculty ratio is 11 to one. 100% of our courses are taught by professors. There are no TAs or no grad students teaching any courses, period. And not only that, but 90% plus of your faculty who will be teaching your courses are full time on campus. So not only are your courses taught by professors, they're not taught by professors that are coming in, teaching and then leaving. You know, they don't have other jobs at community colleges, run a business off campus, come on, teach, and then they, you can never find them when you need them. They truly are mentors and advisors and people that you build really close relationships with over your four years at Puget Sound. And so this, idea of a larger end of small really for me hits that sweet spot. We do have about 2,400 undergraduates and by being a little bit bigger, I think you're going to find that while it's still that small personalized type of education, there is a little bit more breadth and a little bit more, a little bit more depth in our curriculum. 
we have 50 plus academic areas of study and some areas that I think people find quite surprising for a small college. Um, and I'm not gonna read you through the laundry list of academic majors and programs, um, but some of the points that I'd like to emphasize would be areas like bioethics and neuroscience. It is really rare for a school our size to have programs in bioethics and neuroscience. Our programs in environmental policy, international political economy, global development studies, science, technology, and society. We have a gender and queer studies major, an African American studies program, a Latin X program, et cetera. Um, and then when you look at our School of Business and Leadership, our School of Music, and our Asian Studies curriculum, those three areas in particular, business, Asian Studies, and music, on top of the sciences at Puget Sound, represent a huge number of our students and are really rare to find programs like that with as much breadth and depth for a small college. Um, I will uh, turn it over to Tanvi now because another hallmark, I talked about this idea of a living and learning community. I think another real hallmark of a Puget Sound education is this idea of being something that you do, this experiential learning. Um, we're really big into promoting experiential learning amongst our students and I want Tanvi to kind of help define and help you understand what we mean by experiential learning. Thank you. So I love the phrase that a Puget Sound education is something you do, not something you just get. I like to describe experiential learning as all of the learning that students and even faculty are doing outside of the classroom. So like several of the points listed on this slide that can include any type of mentorship, study abroad, research or community projects. We have specific courses in our experiential learning department that students can take for credit that also help them with professional development. Um, RISE is a really good one. It stands for the um, reflective immersive sophomore experience and it's a course specifically designed to help students get an internship for the summer between their sophomore and junior year since a lot of our curriculum requires that you have an internship. I know personally for business I can't graduate without an internship so that class was really helpful for me to get my internship um, and it really focuses on how to edit your CV and cover letter, do interview prep, how to even look for a job, what tools can you use that you can kind of apply in your future and not just in your undergrad career. And we also really highlight the reflection part of experiential learning. So yeah, you did the thing, yeah, you went abroad, but what did you, what were the takeaways? What did you learn from it? And how can you apply that to your future? And this doesn't just have to be for study abroad. It can be for being an athlete on campus. It can be for working in the library and everything in between because you are truly building those skills here on campus. So that's kind of a little bit about experiential learning. Um, I mentioned I work in that department. I actually run a volunteer program um, that focuses on mentorship. So we go to local high schools and help them with the college application process, whether that's filling out the FAFSA or looking over their personal statements and things like that. And it's really enriching and has really kind of cultivated my college experience to be something that I can look back on fondly and say that I achieved things both inside and outside of the classroom. Great, thank, thank you, Tanvi. Um, Romy mentioned she's a former student athlete at Puget Sound. Um, Puget Sound is a Division Three college, NCAA Division III. Um, and while athletics is not something that we, you know, live and die on at Puget Sound, it's a big part of the experience for a lot of our student body and a big part of the school spirit that drives being a logger on campus. Uh, I was also a student athlete. I played soccer at Puget Sound, so it's near and dear to my heart. Uh, but I'll let Romy, since, um, you know, I'm 20 years past my prime and not anything uh, closely, to, cl <laughs> don't resemble anything of the athlete that I used to be. So Romy, this is all you. Okay, awesome. So like Mike said, we do have an athletic program here at the University of Puget Sound. Um, we are Division Three, um, part of the NCAA um, Northwest region, and we have 23 varsity sports. Um, as well as a bunch of different clubs and intramurals. Uh, I know I played two sports in high school. I wrestled, I played softball. And so I definitely knew that like, I wanted to have the athletics somewhere in my college experience. Um, I wasn't really quite sure that I wanted to, you know, play softball at the collegiate level, but I was open to trying and seeing what my options were. Um, so I actually ended up getting an email from one of the coaches um, on the rowing team and he 
emailed me, approached me. He knew I did athletics in high school. And he was like, hey, we have this wonderful rowing program. Um, if For those of you guys who don't know, rowing is actually um, a lot of the time people start rowing in college just because a lot of high schools don't really have access to um, bodies of water or <laughs> don't have like the financial um, support to have a rowing team on their high school team. Um, so high school, or sorry, so collegiate rowing actually has a whole novice season for incoming first years or sophomores or anyone who would like to try a sport. Um, and it is a varsity level sport. So I did get that, you know, that experience of having to balance like academics and athletics at the same time. Uh, we were waking up at four o'clock in the morning, every morning, um, six days a week, actually. And so I definitely learned a lot about learning how to balance my schedule. I'm an exercise science major. That's a really heavy major. Um, so kind of just like having to go in and talk to professors and being like, hey, I'm going to miss this class. Uh, what is the information that I need or what do I need to do? So I will be prepared for the next time I come in class and things like that. Um, so within our athletics facility and everything like that, we actually have like a student um, run rock climbing wall. We have a swimming pool, a gym, uh, we have a dance room. So a lot of the different clubs and intramurals also use that. It's not only for varsity sports, as well as um, all like through your logger card, all students of the Puget Sound community are able to go into like the weight room and everything like that. It's gorgeous. It was, um, pretty new uh, for the past couple of years. And so with that student logger card, you get access to all of those facilities. And so it's super nice. Um, but yeah, like I said, it's very important to me at least to kind of have that full well-rounded college experience, uh, which is why I definitely urge you when you guys are looking at colleges to kind of take notes of all the different activities that you might have access to be involved in and everything like that. So I'm gonna give it back to Mike and he's gonna finish off our presentation. Thanks, Romy. I feel so bad because I did the same thing to you that I just did to Tandi, and I swear both times it was just accidental. My fingers just hit the mouse and I wasn't trying to tell you to wrap it up. That was, and Tandi earlier, I wasn't trying to do that either. So just so you know. Um, and, I was like, that's so subtle, Mike. Thanks. <laughs> yeah, I could see when I advanced the slide that you went, oh, I'm sorry, I'll move, I'll, I'll wrap it up. <laughs> um, Anyways, uh, yeah, that is Mount Rainier. Uh, so for those of you not from the Pacific Northwest, and I promise that is not Photoshop. Um, that is actually what Mount Rainier, or as my family has started to call it, Mount Tacoma, uh, which is what the indigenous people of the Northwest called it uh, prior to it becoming Mount Rainier. Um, but uh, that is Mount Tacoma in the background from our campus, and we really are that close. Now you can't ski down the mountain right into Tacoma. It is about 45 minutes as the crow flies and about a 60 to 90 minute drive depending on where you're going to get up on the mountain. Um, but it is really in our backyard. Um, Tanvi mentioned our fitness center being relatively, and Tom, Romy mentioned our fitness center being relatively new. I'm just going to brag and say that you're not going to find many uh, colleges out there in Division Three that have the types of athletic facilities that we have. And so whether you're a varsity athlete or just someone that likes to go work out, um, we have state-of-the-art, beautiful new equipment in a beautiful new athletic center that's available to all of our students, including faculty and staff. Okay, the application to Puget Sound. We'll move pretty quickly through application and financial aid and then get to your questions. Uh, we are on the Common App, as you see there. Uh, we do require school report and official transcripts. Um, like I mentioned earlier, we've been a test optional school for seven or eight years already. It's not been a major factor in our decision making, in our financial aid awarding. Um, we usually see 15 or 20 percent of our applicants go test optional. This year, we anticipate the vast majority of our students will be test optional. Um, all we do is really put more emphasis on the rest of the application in that holistic review process for those test optional students. Um, this slide is not 100% accurate. It says test optional questions. We are dropping our test optional questions this year. In prior years, you would choose not to submit the test score and then have to answer a few short responses or a few short questions in lieu of those tests. We're not doing that this year. We're trying to make the process as streamlined as possible for you all. Um, with regards to merit scholarships, then the formula that we use for merit scholarships 
the part of the equation that we use for SAT and ACT, we essentially just replace with more of your GPA and the other parts of your application. And so you're not gonna be penalized for merit scholarships as you go test optional in our process. We do have three different application programs. Early decision is binding. That is for students who are wearing the sweatshirt, you know, you bought the swag for mom and dad or grandma and grandpa, you're all in, you're totally committed. We do see a lot of athletes actually go early decision or those students that are really the kinds of people that like, you know, to make decisions early, have peace of mind, have their application read early, have a decision in hand in early December, have all of your financial aid and scholarships on the table and be able to, before you hit the new year, have that process wrapped up. We see the majority of our applications come in early action or regular with early action making up the larger of that process or the larger between early, um, early action and regular. Uh, early action is not binding. You're not committing to the university. You're just going to be read at a priority deadline. You're gonna hear back from us typically in mid-December and no later than January 15th. If you apply by the regular deadline, you're gonna hear back from us usually around mid-February, but no later than mid-March. March 15th would be the reply date, but we're usually able to get those out sooner than that. There is no benefit financially to any of these programs, right? So doing early decision, early action, or regular is not going to impact your scholarships or your financial aid whatsoever. It's just going to impact the timeline that you're doing your college process and when you hear back from us. Speaking of financial aid and scholarships, um, you see the total cost of attendance this year is just under $65,000. On average, our students receive a little bit more than half of that with scholarships and financial aid. Um, Merit-based scholarships last year ranged from $15,000 to $26,000. Uh, and do, I do anticipate seeing these numbers creep up a little bit this year. Um, maybe not much, but in typical years, and this is not a typical year, so we'll see. Um, this is the first semester actually for our, our students coming in and we've seen this reduction in our total cost of attendance. Um, uh, but in most years, we see a slight increase, uh, but those merit scholarships and the total packages with need-based and merit scholarships combined do typically increase as the cost of attendance increases as well. A lot of colleges have these really simple grids where you, know, you have your GPA and your test score, and then you know you're gonna get this type of scholarship if you come to this college. Um, we do look at a lot of other factors. We look at the strength of your curriculum, the strength of your transcripts. Um, we consider the overall fit of how we read your application, which in large part is the essay that you write for Puget Sound. Um, and so we don't have that easy to read grid where we can tell you exactly what your scholarship will be before you even apply. Um, that's why we have this program called the Dean Scholarship Assurance. The Dean Scholarship Assurance basically says that any student with a 3.6 unweighted GPA will get at minimum $23,000 in merit scholarship. Um, and so I think that's just a nice benchmark for families to know going into the process. Um, it doesn't mean that you know, if you have a 3.5, you're not gonna get any scholarship money. But I think what it's nice to see is that range where our average GPA for incoming students is about a 3.6 unweighted. And so you can see that that average GPA coming in is actually getting significantly more than the middle of our academic merit range. Um, and then those students that are lower on our spectrum are still typically seeing 15 or $16,000 in academic merit scholarship. And those high flyers, those 3.9 and 4.0 students are gonna see the higher range of that merit scholarship. We only look at FAFSA. We don't require CSS profile or other institutional forms in order to be eligible for need-based financial aid. So we do look at that federal methodology to determine need. One thing I do encourage a lot of families to take advantage of is the net price calculator. I think early on in the process, before the application, you know, these numbers can be really daunting. $65,000 a year. How many families out there can actually write a check for $65,000 a year maybe for not just one, but maybe for two or three dependents or children in your family. Um, so I think one of the ways to reassure families is to get onto that net price calculator. 
Um, you're going to fill out some fi family financial information, fill out some basic academic information for the student, and we'll provide you with an estimate. It's only an estimate, but it at least allows you to kind of get a ballpark for what a Puget Sound education might actually cost. Since, like most colleges, you're not going to get a financial aid package and scholarship information until you've applied and actually been admitted to the university. So, um, oh, thanks, Jen. I think Jen, behind the scenes, unshared my screen. Um, so at that, we'd like to turn over the next oh, 10 minutes that we have left for your questions. Uh, Tanvi and Romy have been looking at the Q&A uh, as I've been chatting the last 10 minutes here. Tanvi and Romy, is there anything that's come up that um, we can bring to the, the attention of the group? Yes, I think it would be a great time to address our student accessibility and accommodation services since we've had a couple of questions about how uh, we support students with learning differences and things like that. Okay. Uh, Tanvi or Romy, do you guys want to jump in or do you want me to take this one? Um, I can kind of give it from a student's perspective just because in my various classes I've had peers that have had learning differences and basically you can get a plethora of um, accommodations through the SAA or Student Accessibility and Accommodations Office. Some things involve getting your notes taken for you if you um, need that and it can be from another student. Um, being a note taker means you are working on campus actually. Another one is getting extra time for tests if that's something that you qualify for and even being able to take your tests in a separate place than the general classroom that the majority of your peers are taking it. Um, those are the three that I know of. Um, Mike, I'm sure you have more information about that. Yeah, I mean, absolutely. I mean, usually when I talk about this question, I start, you know, from the advising program that we have, um, not just student accessibility and accommodations or SAA, and those are for students with documented learning differences. And that office is really responsive to prospective students. Um, if you haven't already experienced this, colleges like Puget Sound, I would say for most of these CTCL colleges, you're gonna be surprised with how responsive um, we are to student questions before you even apply to the university. So reach out to those offices and ask those questions because I think with accommodations and accessibility, you know, the answer is yes, we're really good at serving students and working with students, but those questions get nuanced and personal really fast and going to the experts that you'll actually be working with is what I recommend as you're going through the application process. Broadly speaking, just the type of support and services from you know, residential advisors down to you know, RAs, resident assistants, resident directors living on campus, peer advisors, peer tutors, faculty advisors, just professors that you get to know through your classes, Staff members like me, who you might meet through the admission process, who would love it if you remember your admission counselor and say, hey, let's go get coffee. There are so many people who will look out for you and take care of you. And that's what you're paying for when you go to a college with a student to faculty ratio of 11 to one. But then when you add staff and faculty together, you're talking about a ratio of almost five to one of professional people on campus to students. It's incredibly empowering if you take advantage of it. What other questions? I haven't had a chance to track the Q&A. What other questions have um, surfaced? Are there themes? Another one uh, that is pretty common is what classes are going to look like just amidst the pandemic and how the university is handling that in terms of distance learning. Yeah, I mean, I can start. I've already referenced the fact that we are online this fall. Um, we really hope to be back in person in the spring. Um, but Unfortunately, we're not going to roll the dice and gamble with student health and faculty and staff health. And I don't say that to be mean or disparaging to other colleges and universities. Everybody is in a different part of the world in a different place in a different community and have to make the best decisions um, that they can moving forward. Um, I will say that I've been really proud of how the university has put students first throughout this entire process. Um, everything from helping students ship stuff back financially in the spring after they went home and couldn't return to campus. Um, and, um, you know, in every decision that we've made and we've tried to be as transparent as possible. How are classes going to work? Um, I think it, it depends on the professor. Um, you know, there are going to be 
some people meeting on campus for labs, music, studio art. So we are allowing some students to live on campus. We anticipate about 200 students on campus this fall. Um, those are students who have academic needs to be there. Those are students who have food scarcity or internet issues or just um, insecure home situations where being on campus is a safer environment for them. Um, what online cat classes actually look like, I am not the one to answer that. Maybe Tanvi and Romy, having lived through it in the spring a little bit, could give a little bit of insight to, and, and maybe in particular how it might be different from the high school. And I know you didn't do online courses in high school, but if you can give them a taste of what it was like at Puget Sound. Um, yeah, I can answer that first. Um, so for me, at least it was, I'm gonna admit it was actually a little bit difficult just because of like having STEM classes and science and labs and all that online. Um, but for the most part, most of my professors actually used Zoom, which I'm sure we're all very familiar <laughs> with now. Um, and for the most part, it actually, uh, it wasn't required to go to class, but that's kind of like, once you step onto a college campus, you understand that like when you go to class, you're, you're the only one benefiting from it. And so it was definitely uh, easier for me to at least wake up and just hop on a Zoom um, and also just get to connect with my professors on a deeper level just because it's actually easier for me to just click a Zoom link when they say office hours are open than for me to honestly like walk across the campus and go to their office hours at X time of the day because I have so many different things going on. I could be studying, I could have a club meeting, I could have so many different things. Um, so I personally actually got to really connect on a deeper level with all my professors once we went online, but I know Tommy might have other or different experiences, so I'll let her kind of touch up on those. Yeah, I think my experience is really similar. Something I really found um, helpful and really empowering was the fact that my professors were still present at the same capacity as they were in person. So I found myself going to a lot of Zoom office hours and um, professors were really encouraging, didn't, you know, I barely had professors cancel class and I was expecting just hearing from my friends at big schools, you know, oh, we don't have class this week or things like that. Not the case at UPS. Um, I was going to class every day and they were also being accommodating for the fact that we made the pivot really quickly, which was nice because that is a circumstance that should have been and was um, accounted for. So I think in general, it was very supportive from both the administration and the faculty. I also did see a question about mental health and I did wanna to touch on that like really quickly because I do think that's also a really important topic to kind of touch on. Um, so we actually have in our student well, or student real Luck center, excuse me, we have uh, CHAWS, which is our counseling health and wellness services. Um, and basically our university offers counseling to all students um, included in tuition. So at no extra cost. And so you can actually go in and they'll do a screening and then they'll match you with um, a counselor or a therapist online. We actually online for now, but usually in person, but we actually have um, in like one-on-one -on -one sessions as well as group sessions. So. Um, I know that a lot of students actually benefit a lot more with group sessions. Also, it helps you kind of open up your network of people and your support system within that as well. Um, but also, we have like an on-site doctor too. I know I got strep out in mono at the same time, like a double whammy. Um, it was not fun. And so I went to like the doctor's office and they were able to prescribe me medication and get that all handled with. Um, but in regards to like mental health, I do know that if you... Um, need to see someone more often because since we do have like this is open to all of our students they can't promise to see like on a weekly basis necessarily they do have a lot of referrals that they can send you to a bunch of different people off campus um, and super super accessible so that option is available to you um, and also you can look on our website and if you just look up cause or counseling health and wellness services you can get more information on that we are out of time the 45 minute is a hard stop, sadly, and I see there's about a dozen questions, which I think is great. We wanna continue the conversation with you all. We're gonna get a transcript of those questions so that we can follow up with you. Please find us online. There's a wealth of information, admission at pugetsound.edu. Thank you so much for attending. I apologize that we couldn't get to everyone's questions and we will hear from you again soon, I hope. And thank you to the Puget Sound team for spending their uh, later afternoon with us and sharing all this great knowledge. Yes, as Mike said, we will be sure that they get your information as well as the questions that were asked 
throughout this presentation, so the conversation definitely doesn't have to stop here. Um, but as you exit the Zoom webinar, you will be taken to a quick survey. It's only four questions, so we hope to hear your feedback regarding this particular session. And then as I mentioned in the beginning, all of our sessions will be, all of our session recordings will be available on our website. And if you're interested in learning about more colleges and universities on, uh, that are within the Colleges That Change Lives group, um, check back on our schedule and we have more sessions through Tuesday evening. So I hope everyone has a great morning, afternoon, evening, wherever you are. Um, and thanks once again to the Puget Sound team. Have a great night.